Real stories of werewolves, the dogman from history, from your emails, illustrated and animated with the democratizing magic of machine learning AI. Welcome to Scary Stories. Werewolf Against Bigfoot Dear Scary Stories NYC, I am a long-time listener who has been trying to figure out if your show is for real or not. I kind of feel like some of the stories might be real, but not all of them. You probably don't even know yourself, I suppose. Well, this one really happened to me, but hardly anybody's going to believe it. I didn't just see one large cryptid, I saw two. And the story gets pretty complicated for something that took maybe a half hour in total to play out IRL. I live in a small town in west central Pennsylvania, and that is also where I lived when this happened back in the year 2002. 911 had happened at the end of the previous year, and my cousin's husband had been taken from us on that horrible day. So that's kind of how I remember stuff from back then, pre-911 and post-911. This was after, but only by about seven or eight months, as this was late spring or early summer. The forest was in bloom, but it wasn't thick and overgrown yet as it starts to get by the end of July or August. When I say the forest in this case, I mean the patch of woods behind me that leads in a few different directions. I can walk through there to get to the little shopping center where I can pick up most of the supplies I need day to day, and I can also get to the back doors of a few of my neighbors through those woods. On this night in particular, I was walking home from the house of a man I was dating at the time, but who has moved out of the state many years ago as I write this. We had been partying a bit, and I was slightly out of my head as I made the walk home through the darkness. Even though it's usually a 10-minute walk at most if you take it slow, I managed to get a bit turned around in the trees due to my feeling lightheaded. I made lefts where I should have made rights, and the next thing you knew, I looked up and saw the tallest gorilla in history running out of some trees and heading directly for me. This was a creature that ran on two legs, with better posture than your average gorilla, and it stood two or three heads taller than me as well. I was panicked, and I found myself sobering up pretty quickly. Now as I ran for my life, I understood this was not a gorilla. I was not in Africa, I was in Pennsylvania, and so that meant I was being chased by a Bigfoot. There was nothing else that could have been. So needless to say, I screamed and ran for my life, not really having any idea what direction I was running in. I figure many or most of you can probably accept the plausibility of my story so far. Here's where we get to the train stop where a lot of you are going to jump off the vehicle though. Because while I was running from that Bigfoot, I looked up in front of me and I saw I was running directly toward some kind of super muscular dog or wolf that stood up on its hind legs and seemed to be extremely unhappy about all the shouting I was doing. So I had a squatch coming up my rear and this werewolf looking guy up in front of me and I was about to become the meat in a cryptid sandwich. I would like to say I made a quick decision and a sharp move getting out of the way of both creatures. I would like to say that but it was more like I felt like I was going to faint and then I tripped over a rock then I sort of did a three-quarter sideways somersault into a bunch of bushes. It was entirely by accident. Now I lay panting on my back in the bushes looking up as I saw and felt the Bigfoot storm past me and launch directly into an attack on that other creature that in retrospect I figure had to be the Pennsylvania Dogman. People asked me what kind of a fight it was and they asked me if the Bigfoot used weapons like sticks. Well, it was a savage fight. And no, there was no usage of weaponry. I saw the Bigfoot club that monster dogman with what appeared to be a closed fist at one point. But most of my memories of that clash involved wincing, as the two of them tried to bite each other's faces off. They kept launching attacks with their fangs. I rarely saw them using their claws to fight. They would just run right at the other one's face, with their mouth open and their fangs out. It looked to me like they knew each other. This seemed to be something personal between the two of them. So, of course, I got up and left them alone to work out their differences. Eventually. When I could breathe normally again, when I could stand up again, and when I could walk again without tipping over or feeling faint, 
In the meantime, I watched a nasty and bloody battle. These two creatures each seemed determined to finish the other one off. It wasn't a normal turf battle between predators. At least not according to what I've read. These guys weren't bluff charging. They were just charging. And the repeated attempts to bite the faces of the other beast made it feel very personal. I'm not sure if they'd ever seen humans before, but I have little doubt that they knew an awful lot about each other. I admit I was afraid to move with the fight still going on. I really didn't want to stop them from fighting each other, because then I might be directing them to chase me. So I watched them tearing each other apart as quietly as I could. And then I saw the Bigfoot run away at a fast speed. The direction he was heading in was the direction I thought my home was in as well. So I was a mite concerned about this. The Wolfman tore after the Bigfoot and I stood up only to find myself getting sick all over the forest floor. Once I was well enough again to walk, I decided I should go in the opposite direction of where I'd seen the two large cryptids run off to. That should have brought me back to the home of the guy I was dating. I had become so turned around that it turned out I was walking toward my own home. The creatures had run toward the boyfriend's place. When I got home safe, I spent most of the rest of the night being sick in the luxury of my downstairs basement which is a step up from the forest floor in any case. Did I get photos? No, I did not have a cell phone that had a flasher that could take good photos in darkness. I think I was still using one of those little Captain Kirk flip phones back then, do you know what I mean? I don't know if you can remember back to 2002 or not. At any rate, I've never seen a cryptid again, and as far as I know, nobody else in this area has either. I've never heard any Bigfoot or Dogman stories from around here. So I haven't got an explanation for what happened that night. Clearly it was some kind of a fluke or aberration. I mean, those were two creatures very familiar with each other. Yet this part of PA has no other Dogman or Bigfoot stories attached to it, as far as I know. So maybe the two of them weren't from here. Maybe the two of them were visiting from some other place. Or maybe not visiting. It was like the Bigfoot had escaped to here. And the dogman was pursuing him, attempting to bring him to justice or some such thing. I know that sounds crazy, but this entire thing was crazy from the start. Why should my theories about it make any more sense than the actual incident did? I don't think the Squatch was any match for that werewolf. And those are the impressions I got from watching the battle of... Werewolf against Bigfoot. Squash, just you watch. It no sin, be scared of him. Bigfoot, he fighting the dog man. I am running him in the fog man. Bigfoot, he losing ground. Dog man running him out of town.
Werewolf Beats Bigfoot. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I saw a fight between a Bigfoot and a werewolf. I mean, I think the one creature was a Bigfoot, and I know the second one was a werewolf, not a dogman. How do I know? Because sometime after that creature bit the Bigfoot, I saw the Bigfoot become sick and transform into a hideous canine version of his former self. How else to explain that? Except to say that I think I saw that Sasquatch get turned into a werewolf. I really don't love using those words to describe what I saw, since neither of them really looked at all like what I would have expected a Sasquatch or a werewolf to look like. I just think that must have been what they were. But I'll get into details and try to explain what it is that I was looking at, so that you'll know what I mean when I use those sorts of generic terms. Now, these were very specific creatures different from what I've seen in movies or on TV. So I was camping with my friend who I will call Jeremy. He and I used to be roommates in college, and we've stayed drinking buddies and occasional camping buddies since then. I've just turned 27, so I guess he and I have been friends since we were both 18. We met as freshmen. Now, this cryptid stuff happened during the pandemic, so what year was that? I don't even remember. It was an election year, probably. So, we were both adults, out of school and working jobs for a few years by this point. Jeremy is the taller of the two of us, and back then he was more athletic. When the gyms were closed during the pandemic, he kind of got out of the habit of exercising, and these days I'm probably in better shape than he is. But back then, he was still in shape and still confident, and still making good money and dating different women. I hadn't really seen him look scared before, when he came running out of the woods in the late afternoon saying he had seen a big Sasquatch-looking guy out in the woods, staring at him while he was trying to pee. He told me he couldn't pee once he saw it, and I made a crack about how I'd pee my pants if I saw what he saw. I guess that was rude, but I thought he was joking around. Like I said, I had never seen him look scared before, and he was bigger than me. I thought this was Jeremy putting on his Oh, I'm so scared act. I thought he was pulling my leg to try to get me scared, so I just made fun of him. But it turned out he really meant it. So all of a sudden I was apologizing and Jeremy was getting all emotional. Like some emo girl. I'm not trying to be rude. I just want you to understand how surprising this was. Like he went into the woods one person and came out someone else. So as I was apologizing and trying to get my friend to calm down. I began thinking about how scary that thing must have looked if it could turn my big, brave friend Jeremy into a blubbering idiot with just one glance. I got the full body shivers from that. And so Jeremy and I started drinking the beers a little early. Why we didn't pack up and try somewhere else, I'm not sure. But we drank some beers and built up a big roaring fire. After we got some food in our bellies, we didn't feel so scared anymore, at least I didn't. When I realized I had to pee, I just got up and wandered away from the fire into the darkness. I wasn't thinking about forest monsters or anything like that at all. I had moved past all that stuff already. But as I was zipping up after doing my duty, I got that feeling of being watched. I looked all around. When I saw red eyes at about 11 o'clock, looking like they were a head or two above me off the ground. I did not think Sasquatch. Honestly, I had first thought Shadow Person, because all I saw at first was the dark silhouette and the bright red eyes. But when the dark figure got angry at me staring at it, then it began to charge toward me, and I saw that it was not a flat silhouette at all, but a three-dimensional creature of some sort, and even larger than I had originally thought. I turned and ran toward the 4 o'clock position when our camp was at 6 o'clock, so that was a huge mistake on my part to start with. It's a lucky break for you, though, because my idiocy is the only reason I got to witness the stuff that I'm about to recall for you. So I ran through the woods in the dark, pretty wasted if I'm going to be honest, and I kept running into tree branches and slipping and falling on my face as I ran. At points I was crawling and I was a banged up muddy mess almost as soon as the chase through the dark began. All of this on top of the fact that I had no idea where I was running to in the dark woods. 
I could hear that guy behind me growling like an animal. So I didn't feel like turning around and having a conversation with my pursuer was really much of an option, if you know what I mean. I might have started to figure out that this was the Bigfoot that got Jeremy so scared earlier, but I'm not sure my thinking at that time was really as complex as all that. I was just scared for my life. As I was heading toward a clearing that was better lit than where I was, presumably by moonlight since what else was there, I saw another figure in that clearing, directly in front of me. It seemed to be facing in my direction and waiting to intercept me. I thought I was running into a trap, and I suppose I was, but I thought the figure behind me was deliberately chasing me toward the figure in front. I thought they were working in goats, and that I was about to be eaten for a late dinner by whatever these two figures were. This was not actually the case, but it was my instinctual gut reaction at the time, and my nervous system was overruling my conscious mind. I turned to my left at the last second, heading on a parallel course to the edge of the clearing instead of entering it. I was staying in the dark woods, hoping my pursuer would miss what I had done, and continue running forward into the clearing. While I was making my getaway to the left, I got my foot hooked under a root, and I fell face forward, really wrenching my foot and ankle, bending them in ways God had not intended them to be bent. Nothing was broken, but I was in severe blinding pain for a few seconds, and running was going to be out of the question for at least a few minutes, probably longer. Instead, I got my foot up on a rock and I turned to peer through the vegetation into the clearing. In there, I saw not a shadow man, not a Sasquatch, and not a human, but some kind of a dog-headed man or dogman, I suppose. It was in the clearing waiting for me. That was what I had seen in there ahead of me before I took off to the left. But when my pursuer burst out into the woods, it was not another dog-headed man. It was a big, dark muscle man of a creature, entirely covered in fur. Its eyes were red and this had to have been what chased me. It was not a shadow man because it was three-dimensional, but I wasn't sure what it was. I guess it was ape-like, but not really. It was like a big, hairy man. A sort of a small giant, I guess. Maybe a caveman? It wasn't a human, and it wasn't an ape. So it had to have been a Bigfoot. But I never expected Bigfoot to look quite like this guy. Neither the so-called Sasquatch, nor the, I guess you'd call it a dogman, seemed to have expected the other one. In fact, they both backed away from each other, in an almost comical fashion at first. I'm not sure which one was more scared of the other, but they sure weren't friends or working together. It was clear that the Bigfoot had not intentionally chased me toward that thing. So after initially reacting to each other like Abbott and Costello, their next reaction was not so humorous. The two creatures began circling each other, clearly intending to fight. I was stuck where I was, massaging my foot, and wishing I either had a camera with me, or some means of transportation out of there. It seemed I'd hurt myself right on the borderline between Bigfoot turf and werewolf turf, judging by the attitude both of them were bringing into this fight. It didn't look to me like either one was bluffing, even though they were literally bluffing. I saw the wolf charge the gorilla-looking man, and I saw the Squatch do the same to the wolfman but it was clear with every movement either one made that they were testing the other, measuring the abilities of their opponent. In that sense, they really weren't bluff charges. They were more like reconnaissance missions and information-gathering expeditions. These were two predators who usually took down herbivores, I would imagine. Everything I have ever heard about this type of situation indicated that predators will avoid violent conflict with each other under nearly all circumstances. I was sitting there watching the exception. I was watching a real Bigfoot and a real Dogman battle. Or so I thought. At first the Squatch scored more direct hits than the Upright Wolf, but I'm not sure he was really able to do much damage. If you think of the creature as a Dogman, that doesn't really make too much sense. But if he was a Werewolf, well, don't they have some kind of healing ability? If we assume this was a werewolf and not a dogman, 
that maybe he was letting the Bigfoot hit him. This way, the Squatch does his worst damage and tires himself out. But the werewolf keeps withdrawing and giving his body time to heal before taking another attack from the Bigfoot. The Sasquatch's attacks were all blunted pummeling, like he sort of punched the wolf at one point, and he backhanded him another time. I saw him grab the wolf and throw him into a tree as well. The wolf mostly darted around and snarled while the Squatch tired himself out. Both creatures spent as much time on two legs as four, attacking each other from left, right, above, and below. It was pretty amazing to see their abilities, but I couldn't forget that this wasn't some kind of athletic display. This was a blood fight, for real. Once the Bigfoot started slowing down a bit, I saw that Wolfman start to finally get serious. But his style of fighting was different from the Sasquatch. The Dogman was all slashing claws and biting jaws. I could tell when the Bigfoot connected by the thudding sound. But I could tell when the Werewolf connected because the Bigfoot would let out a high-pitched yelp, like a dog whose tail you just stepped on. The Werewolf would do these chaotic attacks, sometimes running past the Bigfoot at full speed, then darting away, but other times slashing and biting as he continued to run at full speed. After a few direct hits, the Werewolf seemed to withdraw for longer periods than earlier, watching the Bigfoot, looking for something. What was he looking for? All I know is that when he didn't see it, he ran in for another few anarchistic dive bomb attacks against his larger opponent. After some time, the Bigfoot seemed to be having issues. He was slower to react when the Dogman ran past for one thing, but he also seemed to be having some kind of a problem of some sort. It kind of looked like he was sick. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. He seemed like he was going to vomit, but he didn't. And then he started to have some kind of spasmodic attack, flinging himself all around the clearing and making a horrible racket. He crashed off balance into a tree all the way on my side of the clearing at one point, and I had leaves and branches rained all over me. I almost had an attack of my own when that happened, but the Squatch staggered back over to the other side in a second or two. The werewolf seemed to be expecting all this, and he seemed to be enjoying himself, as far as I could tell. The twitchy, gyrating Bigfoot started to look... different. His snout seemed longer than it had before, and his ears seemed less like those of a monkey than they had before, too. It wouldn't have been something I would have ever even thought about before, but I was seeing the Bigfoot monster become a werewolf version of itself. Its legs looked different, and the changes seemed to be painful to endure, judging by the sounds his werewolf Bigfoot was making. When he dropped to his knees and howled, the werewolf joined him, and the two howled to the heavens for what seemed to my eardrums to be six or seven years, but was probably in actuality only three or four months. I started to shake all over, and I couldn't control it. I still don't know what that was about, but at the time, I thought it was some kind of serious physical problem. I mean, I thought I was going to die, so I laid down and I tried to slow my breathing. It turns out that was a good thing to do because I was probably having a panic attack. Breathing like you're calm will help you get calm again. I didn't know that. I just got lucky. And I kept lying on that cold forest ground, trying to calm myself down, focusing on breathing slowly and deeply, when I suddenly noticed that the sky I was staring up at was starting to turn purple and pink. I also realized that I hadn't heard monster noises for a long time, and I started to feel a little more normal again. My foot and ankle were still sore, but I felt a lot less scared in the morning light with no monsters, so I started to hobble and hop back to camp. Jeremy had not noticed I was gone, but he noticed my limp when I came back to camp. I told him it was the Bigfoot who gave me the limp, but now the Bigfoot is a werewolf, and he thought I had eaten some strange mushrooms. I ate some food then went to sleep in my tent. I didn't get up till noonish, and when I did, I told Jeremy we had to pack and leave. 
He still thought I was tripping out, so I had to prove to him that I was just tired, not stoned or whatever. I told him the entire story, and even though he was the one who had seen the Bigfoot first, he acted like he didn't believe my story. I guess Bigfoot seemed real to him, but not werewolves? Or no, it was that he could accept a dogman, but not a werewolf. He says a dogman could be real, but transforming mythical creatures are impossible. Now that's kind of an insulting thing to say to a guy who just saw a Bigfoot transform into a werewolf. Or a were-squatch? A werefoot. Anyway, in the time since then, Jeremy says he's come to accept that I really mean it about this story. And he no longer suspects I was on some weird fungus from outer space or anything. But he has tried to get me to go back to this park to camp on several occasions, and I think he's out of his mind. He says the chances of seeing a cryptid in the same location twice in one lifetime are almost zero. But he keeps forgetting one key fact. I didn't just see a Bigfoot. I saw a werewolf. It was able to turn that Squatch into something else. And that means it could do the same to me or to any human as well. I don't personally want to become a werewolf. And I don't want to be camping with Jeremy when he gets turned into a werewolf either. I'd rather spend my time off in places less known for monsters that turn you into monsters. I'm taking my next vacation in my bathtub. I'm hoping my skin doesn't pucker too much, but in either case, it's better than worrying about becoming a cursed, hairy monster. If you want a coloring book full of monster rusty light, then give this a look. It'll give you more fright, right? Scary stories, coloring book, werewolf coloring book. And just to make your mind explode, it's a digital download. All it costs is 209, and then you will be feeling fine. Coloring monsters today. It's a coloring book parade. Okay, link is in the description. The Dogman Bigfoot family crossed the road. Dear Scary Stories, NYC, I want to tell you a story my wife Sherry mocks me for telling. She calls it my song and dance, or she calls it Mama Papa Cryptid Stompa after an old song from the 20th century. But if you ask her if she wasn't there when this all happened, she will admit that she in fact was. She's just tired of hearing about this story because it challenges her worldview. She likes to act as though I'm crazy because I saw this very diverse cryptid family. But the thing is that she saw the exact same thing that I saw. And what I saw was a mama dogman, a daddy Bigfoot, and a family of ugly ducklings that I'm not sure I would know what to call. I know we're all created as God intended us to be. I know he loves all his children. It's just that those offspring were creatures from out of my worst nightmares, and I shiver at the mere idea of their existence. Let me explain to you exactly where this all happened, since I don't think you have any familiarity with this area. It's a part of Pennsylvania, sandwiched in between Ohio and western upstate New York, that I don't hear you talk about so much on your show. At the time, and this was almost 30 years ago, we were staying in Meadville, which was located near some friends and family that we had personal and business dealings with back then. In fact, this happened as my wife and I were heading out to a social gathering with those very same friends and family. We were driving north on Dixon, heading toward Woodcock Lake Park, 
It's not a long drive. We're talking about six or seven miles maximum. So even though it was dark out as we drove up there to meet with our friends, we weren't feeling scared or anything like that. We had been hanging out a lot that summer in that area with those same people and nothing weird ever happened except for this one night. Of course, these days and ever since then, I feel creeped out over there, even in the full light of a sunny noon day. But on that particular night in the early 1990s, Sherry and I were joking around and laughing and in a good mood. All of a sudden, the mood got changed for us and drastically. I've sent you a screen grab of the area this happened in, which I took from Google Street View. You see how the road has trees and nature on both sides, and you can't see very far off the road. This was early nighttime, so the visibility would have been even less than in this picture. From the right side over there ahead of us ran this big Sasquatch. It came out of the woods at us, bellowing and running straight for our car. Naturally, I slammed on the brakes and we locked our doors. I had not known that Bigfoot existed in this part of the country, but we both instantly knew this was a Sasquatch that we were seeing running toward us. We had seen enough TV shows and movies by then to know what a Bigfoot was, and this looked enough like your standard one that we didn't have to put too much thinking into it. It was larger than a man could be, and I don't just mean that it was tall. It seemed proportionally larger than a man. Heck, it was bigger than a bear standing on its hind legs, or at least any bear that I've ever seen. Its steps shook the ground underneath our car, and it looked to have enough strength to smash the entire front end. It looked to be as strong as a Jack Kirby superhero from back in the 1960s, like the Thing from the Fantastic Four, if you know the reference. He's the big orange one that looks like he's made out of rocks, only... This big Sasquatch was not wearing any underpants. So I braced for impact when that Bigfoot stopped short directly in front of our bumper and he shouted at us. It was terrifying, but it sure beat the heck out of him, beating the heck out of us. I was beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was thinking, just let the Bigfoot yell at us as long as it wants to, then it'll go away and life can return to normal. This was my new dream in that moment, but I watched that dream die as I saw not one, not two, but three strange-looking creatures amble and prance out onto the road. Lit by our headlights were small hairy creatures that resembled apes, and yet at the same time appeared canine in some ways. Like the hands were those of a monkey, but the ears, those were dog ears. And each of the three of them were different from the other two. One tail was long and seemed prehensile. Another was short, and I'm not sure the third one had a tail at all. Neither my wife nor I knew what to make of any of this, so we just sat there in the car, staring out through the windshield, having our minds blown by what we saw and our eardrums blown out by all that shouting. This was the most nerve-wracking moment of my life up to that point, but things were about to get a whole lot more hectic. Out of those woods flew a kind of a creature which I really had no vocabulary to explain back then. Same with Sherry. We instantly knew the first creature was a Bigfoot, but the only thing we knew for certain about the second one was that it was female. We knew that because it walked upright like the Bigfoot and we could see she was capable of nursing her young. Those three smaller animals had to have been her young. Honestly, I at first thought that the next moment would feature the Bigfoot and this large savage upright walking canine fighting it out. But what happened was very nearly the opposite of that. The Bigfoot backed off and allowed the female canine creature to take over yelling at us. This female had a long snout and vicious looking fangs like the big bad wolf, and she was covered 
and a dark gray shade of dog fur. Its ears were adult versions of the ears on the young creatures, although the younger ones all shared the light brown or even somewhat orange coloring of the Bigfoot. Somewhere in the middle of being barked at and growled at and otherwise verbally assaulted by the upright walking female canine, my brain put it all together that this motley crew were in fact a family. They had to be. My wife, as I mentioned, doesn't like to talk about that evening anymore, but when she used to, she used to say that the dog sounded like it was barking in complete sentences. It didn't sound random. It sounded like a language, just not a language that she or I knew. Ever since Sherry said that, I had to agree, but it's hard to say for sure. It could very well have just been animal noises, and the idea that we were hearing real language might have been a result of how frightened we were in that moment. So the little ones had finished crossing the road, and the Bigfoot was trying to get his mate's attention. She was too busy telling us what she thought of us, which was not very much. I never felt such complete loathing before. I never felt so disliked. I hadn't even done anything but exist. So I guess this must have been one of those overprotective mothers. The Bigfoot came over toward us, and I got even more scared. So far, we'd only been threatened. We had not had ourselves or our car actually attacked. I didn't like the idea of these two large creatures double-teaming us, though, and neither did my wife. Sherry was crying by this point in the story, and it's possible I might have been as well. Things were not looking good for us. The Bigfoot reached out with an incredibly long arm, and he placed that hand gently on the female dogman's shoulder, as if to calm her down. Rather than taking his suggestion, though, the dogman completely flipped out. Her grandkids might say that the upright canine got triggered. She turned and savagely tried to gnaw that Bigfoot's hand off at the wrist for daring to touch her. He backed off quickly, and the dog woman jumped on our hood, getting right up to our windshield and snarling while displaying her formidable set of teeth to us. Believe me, we backed up as far into our seats as we could. Eventually, she was done telling us what she thought of us, and she just pulled back off the hood, shook off her anger, and then turned and dropped to all fours, rudely pushing the squatch to the side as she ran off after her children in the brush. The Bigfoot, for his part, gave us a look and a snort that might have meant nothing at all, but sure seemed to be saying, Sorry, folks, she's always like this. Then he, too, disappeared into the night alongside the road. After that, Sherry and I weren't much in the mood for hanging out in the woods, so we talked our friends into letting us hang out inside their house instead. All night, every little sound we heard from outside shook us up, and we eventually just stayed over for the night. My wife says this strange sighting never changed our lives or our behavior in any way. But I say, we made sure to get where we were going to before sundown for years afterward, and that's not nothing. She can downplay the importance of this encounter all she wants, but I separate our married life into two sections. Before and after, we saw... <laughs> The Dogman, Bigfoot Family, Cross the Road. You'll have to put me board your mouse too. Scratch up that desk with more than you. But here's an idea that's lots of fun. Cover your desk with Dogman and Son. Dogman and Son Desk Mat. Mouse pad for your entire desk. Dogman and Son Desk Mat. Recording yours today. Link is in the description. Dogman. Crashed. Our family vacation. 
Dear Scary Stories NYC, Our family, back in 1993 when this all happened, consisted of me and my two then teenage daughters, who we can call Cagney and Lacey, for the sake of this story. We had lost their mother when the twins were 13 in 1988, and I had become a bit overprotective of them. When this dogman incident took place, we were recovering as a family from our worst fight ever. I had not been coping well with the idea of my girls getting serious boyfriends. I made up reasons to hate the boys which were unfair, and it led to a big blowout. Picking up the pieces afterward, we decided to take a trip out to the lake as a family and to invite the boyfriends along so I could get to know them better. I drove us all out to North Higgins Lake and the state park on the north edge of the lake where we had a fun afternoon. We had brought sandwiches with us, far more than we could eat. I remember the picnic area was right next to a very small beach with crystal clear water. I remember us sitting together along the water, barefoot, with our feet getting splashed each time the waves of the tide came back in. We were resting after having eaten, gathering up the strength to walk back to the car and head on home. I had my arms around my girls, who sat to either side of me. They, in turn, had their arms around me and their boyfriends. It was a peaceful scene at the end of a successful day, but... That peace ended suddenly when, out of nowhere, a huge, upright walking dog plopped himself down to my far right, sitting butt down like a human being, his wolfen legs dangling off into the water. I don't think anyone else noticed him at that point, but when he leaned over and put his arm affectionately around the back of Lacey and her boyfriend both, we all froze up. And we shut up, too. This was not the kind of situation you plan ahead for as a parent. Perhaps it should be, but it just isn't. I think the creature walked out of the brush and onto the beach, the only other option being that it walked toward us through the area with those picnic tables. I looked behind us. I looked behind us, and all the people who had once been there were gone. It was getting later in the afternoon, so maybe the park was closing soon? Or maybe those people had just run off when they saw this big humanoid dog walking on through. If that was what happened, I hope that someone had the courage to risk being mocked and reported this dogman to some park ranger or another. I hoped that somebody already knew about this. I prayed internally that help was on the way, but I knew in my heart of hearts that we were probably on our own, and we better be resourceful if we wanted to avoid having something terrible ruin our day and maybe our lives. Now, at the time, none of us had any idea what was happening, but in the years since then, the twins have become convinced that this all had something to do with some strange puppies that they had played with during our trip to Sleeping Bear Dunes when they were children and their mother was still with us. Sleeping Bear Dunes isn't all that far away from North Higgins Lake. It's over on the western edge of the state by the shore of Lake Michigan. There were two puppies that day who seemed to have no parents or guardians, either canine or human, and they spent the day playing with my girls as though they already knew each other. Cagney and Lacey were both petitioning me to allow them to take the strange puppies home when we noticed that they were no longer around. They had run off somewhere, so it became a moot point about whether we would keep them or not. If my daughter's theory is correct, and those were actually baby dog men, how lucky are we that they ran away when they did? How bad an ending might this story have if we had really brought them back to suburbia with us? One of the reasons I was so concerned about the idea of bringing the pups back with us was the way they looked like wild animals. I wasn't sure if they were wolves or coyotes or just very energetic domesticated mongrels, as I'm far from being an expert on wildlife. Although I don't recall either of them walking bipedally, they were very young. Their fur 
was a dark gray, almost black, same as the large beast who crashed our life at the beach that day. So it's not impossible that my daughters might be correct that the lakeside dogman was merely an adult version of one of those pups from that earlier day. They might explain the apparent friendliness of the dog-like man-thing. At least it might if the dogman had remained friendly. But things played out in a more complicated manner than that. So, to put his arm around Lacey, the dogman had to reach his arm all the way around her boyfriend. Now, the dogman's arm was plenty long enough to do the job, but the boyfriend had himself a face full of dog fur, and he had the audacity to make some kind of unhappy noise and movement to express that unhappiness over the situation. Well, the big dogman didn't like the way the boyfriend squirmed. He began to growl, and that boyfriend froze in fear. Now, animal growls are generally not very loud, but this particular one seemed like the second cousin of a scream. I wouldn't have thought there was a beast who could growl that loud, but there was, and it was sitting down the beach from me, its left hand or claw inches away from me, locked around my daughter Lacey's side. Cagney's boyfriend softly suggested we pass the rest of our picnic lunch down to the dogman, an idea which Cagney objected to strongly. She said those leftovers were going to be lunch tomorrow, and if he wanted to give them away to some kind of stray dog, then he could go out and buy us a lunch for tomorrow with his own money, because she had already spent all her money buying cold cuts to make today's food, and on and on and on. That dogman seemed to be unfamiliar with nagging. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that he was a nagging virgin. The creature stood up to its full height, which was taller than tall is legally allowed to be, and he walked the two steps it took someone as big as he was to walk over to Cagney. He stared at her with his head tilted in confusion, as though he'd never seen or heard anything like her before. Cagney was fully on her high horse, lecturing and hectoring in an alarmist manner, when suddenly she glanced up, and she saw the upright walking canine staring back down at her. I don't think Cagney really understood until that moment that we were not dealing with an ordinary stray dog that dusk darkening into evening. But once she looked up and up, uh, and a little further up, and she saw that massive, broad-shouldered, fur-covered man with a dog's head in place of his own. My daughter Cagney shut right up, and she tossed the remaining picnic food on the sand in the direction of the dogman. Well, I got to see that dogman go down on all fours and eat the lunch Cagney had prepared, and I will say this, they really do look human when they stand up, and canine when they go back down. I've never seen anything like it. They shouldn't be able to appear in both forms like that. And I saw nothing change or alter as he fell down to all fours. It wasn't like Transformers when he visibly changed. It's just that when he was standing up on his hind legs, he looked natural that way. And when he dropped down to all fours, he looked natural that way too. I can't explain it. I'm not a zoologist or biologist. I'm just a dad who needed to get his daughters out of that situation. Which is what I did, basically. We marched out of there quickly and quietly while the dogman scarfed down what would have been our lunch the next day. Sometimes when I tell this story, people laugh in disbelief. Other times people express the notion that I remained more cool-headed than they would have in the same situation. And then there's a third group that ask why I didn't bring the dog man home. I tell you, if I were a rich man, I think I might have. I mean, if I were rich, I could have gotten on my cell phone and called in some kind of team of experts to tranquilize the beast and bring him in. In real life, though, I didn't actually own a cell phone until later in the 90s. My job didn't call for it at the time, 
and in those days it was still something really only the wealthier had for the most part. That was about to change, but it was still that way. Even if I had wanted to bring that dogman home, I don't think I realistically had the resources to do so within my means. The other thing you have to take into account was the surprise attack aspect of the creature's appearance. It's not like we saw it from a distance and invited the dogman to come over. It came up from behind us and wrapped its clawed hand around my daughter's exposed and vulnerable side. All it had to do was draw its arm backwards sharply and parts of her insides wouldn't have been inside any longer. Even if it was trying to be affectionate, it was something larger than any man who ever lived trying to be affectionate. We didn't even know what was happening to us until it was already happening. That's scary in and of itself, don't you think? It was to me on that day. I remember when I was in my 20s with my then girlfriend and we were waiting for a bus together. From behind, someone put their hands over my eyes and said, Guess who? Now, my girlfriend thought we were being mugged, but it turned out to be an old friend of mine from school. Even after we both apologized to her for the scare, my girlfriend was still really shaken up, and she went home instead of where we were gonna go together. In that same way, my daughters and I were shaken up by the sudden, unannounced, and overly friendly appearance of the dogman on that night. Yes, we do realize now that we were lucky to have had the experience, but you'll have to forgive us if we agree that the luckiest part of it was that we got away unharmed. No matter if his intentions may have actually been friendly, we would have appreciated some advance warning before. Dogman crashed our family vacation. We all have Rusty Reyes to thank for these last few episodes. I'm still not well and I'm just doing as well as I can with recording new shows. We got some good ones coming up in the second half of October, at least I hope so. But the main point is that right now there would be no show at all if not for the kind donation made to the show by Rusty. I spent it all on food and bills and now I'm basically trying to fast until YouTube pays us again. You know what it's like, it's 2024. So everyone, if you like the channel, please thank Rusty Reyes for helping us keep the lights on a little bit longer. If you would like to help the channel out too, there are a few ways you can do it. And here to explain all that is our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank? Thanks Biggie, and thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 LaScary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more scary stories.